You know, we better be willing to shout it from the rooftops. I believe in Jesus Christ. He is my Lord and Savior, and I will not back down. You got to be willing to take a stand if you're the only person you know that will take a stand. And quit being so concerned about what everybody thinks. When's the last time you heard a really good message on hell? <laughs> I thought about it and I thought, and I, to be honest, I don't even have the nerve to do this yet and I'm pretty nervy. What would happen if I'd come out into a big conference like this on a Friday night and say, tonight I'm going to talk about how if you don't get right with God, you're going to hell. But you know, there was a day when preachers preached like that. <laughs> we have to get serious about our walk with God and stop looking around to see what everybody else is doing and make a decision for your own life because you are going to stand before God and only give an account of your life, not anybody else's. And I don't know about you, but I am so excited about God, I can hardly stand myself. And I love God, and I'm full of the Holy Ghost, and I hear from God. <laughs> And you can hear from God, and we can all be led by the Holy Ghost, and God can lead us to do great things. And we don't have to bow down to all the nonsense and the stupidity in the world. We've got to take a stand and rise up and act like the army of God, like we say that we are. And then I added one to these six. <laughs> I don't think William Booth would mind. <laughs> And the one I added is that I think that one of the most frightening things today is that we have a lot of information without revelation. Is anybody kind of feeling where I'm coming from with this? Well, I know, I know, I know, well, I know. I remember one night going into a church service at my, the church I was part of at that time and the pastor said he was going to teach on the need to forgive people. And I was so disappointed. <laughs> I was. I thought, oh, I don't need that. <laughs> Come on. This is when you think you know more than what you really know. Oh, I don't. Well, why did I think I didn't need that? Because I'd heard a few sermons on the need to forgive people. And you know, it's like the Holy Ghost said to me, <laughs> oh, you think you don't have any unforgiveness? Well, just wait. And so that night during the service, God showed me two people specifically that I had unforgiveness toward. One of them was a friend of my daughter's who mistreated my daughter, and I didn't like it. My daughter wouldn't stand up to her, and it just irritated the living daylights out of me. Now, mind you, I never prayed for her, but I didn't like her. <laughs> and the other person that God showed me that I didn't like was my own son. I was in unforgiveness toward my own son. And you know why? Because he wasn't as spiritual as I wanted him to be. And I was in leadership at my church, and he embarrassed me. Now, I'm just telling you the truth. He would sit somewhere in the back of the church, and, you know, of course, I was on the front row because I was a leader. <laughs> Had my own parking place out in front with my name on it. I was a big shot. <laughs> Come on, is anybody, anybody with me tonight? But my son was about 18, and he'd sit on the back row and slump down in his seat like this. <laughs> Had 
this look on his face like, when is this going to be over? <laughs> and God showed me, he said, you have unforgiveness toward him because he's not as spiritual as you want him to be. Surely somebody could take that and use it. <laughs> How many people are you mad at in your family just because they're not what you want them to be? I'm going to go over here and talk to these people. Because you guys are a little boring. How many... How many people are you mad at because they're not what you want them to be? Well, who has assigned me the job of deciding what everybody should be? And whatever would make me think that everybody should be what I am? <laughs> or that they should relate to God the same way that I do? <laughs> well, I left her that night quit feeling quite convicted by a message that I started out wishing the pastor wasn't going to preach because I thought I already knew it. And boy, did I get convicted. And so for a couple weeks, I felt like God kept putting on my heart that he wanted me to go and apologize to my son for kind of rejecting him because he wasn't what I wanted him to be. Man, I didn't want to do that because he was a very strong-willed kid, and I thought if I go and humble myself to him, oh, man, he is going to hold that over my head, and whoo, I didn't want to do it. Is anybody feeling where I'm at, okay? But I had to apply that cross that I'm talking to you about tonight. Go do what? I knew God was telling me to do no matter how I felt about it. So it took a couple weeks, two or three weeks, and I remember I went into his room one night. I don't remember if Dave was with me or not, but uh, were you with me? Yeah. We, we went into, it was our son, David, who now runs our world missions. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so, oops, I guess God had a plan. It just wasn't my plan. <laughs> Things just weren't moving along at my pace of what I wanted him to move along at. God was just taking a little more time to change David than I wanted him to. And so we went into his room and I, so I told him, I said, you know, David, God has shown me something along these lines. God has shown me that I have unforgiveness toward you simply because you're not as spiritual as I want you to be. And uh, I said, I just want to tell you I'm sorry and from now on I accept you as you are. Well, he started to cry, these big tears, and he said, you have no idea how bad I needed to hear that. And now listen, listen to what he said. He said, I would love to have the faith that you and dad have. But he said, it's just not, it's not there for me yet. I wish that I felt the way about God that you do, but I just don't yet. And you know what, folks, like it or not, God has a timing in people's lives. And we can't call somebody to a higher level spiritually. The Holy Spirit has to do that. He's the one that has to deal with people. Now, mind you, like I said, I was mad at all these people, but I wasn't praying for them. Well, you know, for the next six months, it was pretty testy because our son would do things we didn't like. Man, it was hard for me to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> but I did. I passed the test. And then one day he came and said he was in a New Year's Eve service at church. And God touched him. And he said, I'm going to go to Florida and go to Bible college. He went to a mission school in Florida, went to Costa Rica as a missionary, married a girl that was also a missionary in Costa Rica. After they were there a while, we asked him to come back and work for us, and 
He's been working for us, I don't know, 25 years, something like that, and has really, with God's help, has been influential and had a hand in every missions work that we have in 150 nations around the world. Come on, give God praise tonight. And that was a message I didn't want to hear because I didn't think I had a problem with it. <laughs> How many sermons do we have to hear on something before we do it? Do you know how many angry people there are in the body of Christ? Do you know how many people that are saved are mad at somebody? And they've heard the messages about forgiveness. Well, see, they know they should forgive, but they don't know. <laughs> Come on, are you with me tonight? They know but we can know up here and not do. But let me tell you something, when you know down here, you're gonna do it. And one of the best ways to discern if you really know something in the fullest way that you need to know it is to ask yourself whether you're doing it or not. <laughs> hmm, you didn't like that, okay. For example, how many of you know that God's Word plainly instructs us not to complain, murmur, and grumble, but to be thankful in all things in every circumstance? How many of you know that? <laughs> how many have heard more than one sermon on that at some point in your life? Okay. How many of you complained about something last week? See, I could just say amen and go home, and I've got my point across. Now, you know what? I'm not going to sit here and say that I never complain, but I don't do it very much anymore, and I used to be a chief complainer, and I'll tell you why. Because I have studied it enough that I have gotten a reverential fear and awe of complaining because I know by Scripture that when I complain and murmur instead of being thankful, that I open a door for the devil. So it's more than just a, oops, I had a bad day. <laughs> Be thankful at all times, in all things, giving thanks, no matter what your circumstances might be, for this is the will of God for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. All right, now. We know that the Bible says that we are to be promptly obedient to God. How many of you know? Promptly obedient to God. Wonder how many people there are in here tonight who have a known area of disobedience in your life that you know God's put his finger on, but you just haven't really laid it on the altar yet. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> you wouldn't want to do that. Okay, now. <laughs> here, you know what really provoked me to preach this message? I was sitting one morning having my God time, which thankfully, after many go-arounds, many wrestling matches with God, I now put that first before anything else because I just, I just, I can't do it. I can't do life if I don't start out with God. <laughs> I mean, I just can't. And if you think you can, then you're going to find out someday you can't. So let me just tell you, the sooner you start spending time with God, every day on a regular basis, talking to him, thanking him, waiting on him a little bit, see if he's got something to say to you. Don't, don't get so caught up in, I don't know what to do when I spend time with God. I think if nothing else, you go sit in a room and say, well, God, here I am. I don't know what to do, but I'm putting you first today. So I'm here, whatever. <laughs> I don't think it's so much about what we do as the fact that we give God the time. So one morning while I was having my God time, it just dawned on me at the end of that time, and I hope you can grasp a hold of what I'm going to try to say to you because it was really what provoked me to do this whole message. 
I, I was just sitting there thinking, I thought, you know what? When I was done, I thought, I don't know if I felt God's presence today or not. Doesn't really matter because I know he's here. Now, I want you to get that. I don't really know if I felt God's presence or not. <laughs> I don't know if there was any proof in the room that God was there. <laughs> I didn't have a goose bump. I didn't have a word of knowledge. I didn't have a prophecy. I didn't see an angel. <laughs> I didn't get any great revelation. It was frankly just kind of a boring morning. Kind of a, you know, okay, I'm here. Do this every morning. I'm going to keep doing it till you call me home. But now listen, it didn't matter to me. <laughs> there was a day when it didn't matter to me. Well, I didn't feel God. I don't, I don't feel that my prayers got answered. Everybody else in the church service tonight said they felt the anointing. I didn't feel anything. <laughs> Do you know how long it's been since I've had some kind of a direct word from God about my life? long time you say well what what are you doing then i'm just doing the last thing he told me <laughs> and you know i have these special days with god when he just shows out and does something really special for me and something radical but my faith is not based on that and yours can't be either you can't say well God loves me because my circumstances are good and God doesn't love me because now I went to the doctor and got a bad report and I'm all confused and I don't understand because if God loved me why in the world would this be happening to me and now I just think I'm gonna quit and give up and all this faith stuff don't even work anyway Did I feel God? I don't know if I felt God. Did you feel God? <laughs> I know that my Redeemer lives. <laughs> I know that He's with me all the time and that He will never leave me nor forsake me. I'm asking you tonight, what do you know? <laughs> I don't want to know what you feel. I don't want to know what you think. Just for tonight, I don't even care what you want. I want to know what do you really know down deep inside as a revelation. I hope you can say, I know that God is with me every moment of my life, that he will never leave me nor forsake me. I know that everywhere I'm going, God has already been there. He's already prepared the way for me. I know his angels are with me. I know that God loves me. I know his anointing and call is on my life. I know that I have gifts and talents. I know that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I know that my sins are forgiven. What do you know? This is the time for us in the body of Christ to make a decision to believe what's in this book. And I don't mean to just mentally assent to it. I mean, we need to base our life on this and say, I'm going to live according to this book. I'm going to live according to the Word of God. And I'll tell you, when you do, oh my gosh. You know, the big OMG <laughs> that we put on all of our text messages. Oh my gosh. It is going to be amazing what God is going to do in the earth. We have to stop being led around by our feelings and our emotions. Now, just for the sake of giving emotions the respect that they're due, let me just say that feelings are not evil, but neither are they holy. They're not sanctified. They simply must be assessed and inventoried for what they are. Emotions are sometimes helpful, at other times they're hurtful. <laughs> they're ever-changing, 
and often for no apparent reason. They come in negatives and positives. They're apt to quit on you when you need them and flare up when you wish they would go away. Not wanting them doesn't make them go away, and wanting them doesn't make them come. <laughs> We have to stop letting our feelings dictate what we're going to do and go deeper than that to what we know we should do. What do you know you should do? We don't get to stay mad at somebody because we feel like it. If we know we need to go and make peace, then we need to go and make peace. Be not weary in well-doing. Don't get tired of doing the right thing because in due season you shall reap if you faint not. And I might add that you are going to have to do the right thing sometimes for a long time before you get a right result. But we don't do what's right to get a result. We do what's right because we love God. Feelings seem to have a mind of their own. They make us laugh one moment and cry the next. <laughs> sometimes you want to hug somebody. Sometimes you want to slap them. But the truly spiritual man or woman of God can hug somebody when he feels like slapping them. <laughs> Completely forgive them when he wants to take revenge. Stay someplace he doesn't want to be. Get away from someplace that he'd like to stay at. Break off a relationship with a friend that is poisoning their life, even though they know they're going to be judged and criticized for doing it. <laughs> some of you could change your life radically if you would just get away from some of the people that you let influence you. <laughs> well, I don't want to be lonely. I don't want to be lonely. Well, I guess you'd just rather be depressed and miserable and stressed out and burned out. You know what? Those people probably don't care anything about you anyway. I'm sorry to say that, but that's just probably the truth. But God loves you, and He'd love to hang out with you. And He'll give you some good friends if you put Him first. Come on. The Bible talks about three kinds of men. The unregenerate man, somebody who doesn't know anything about God at all. The spiritual man, the man who lives according to the Word of God and doesn't bow down to his own thoughts, will, or feelings. The truly spiritual man. And then it talks about the carnal man. Paul talked a lot about carnality, the carnal man. And that's what I was for so many years in my life. I had a love for God. I actually was born again. I, I would have gone to heaven if I would have died. But I didn't know anything. I was just as ignorant as I could be. I thought I knew everything, though, because I went to church all the time. But I didn't know anything. <laughs> and so I walked in the flesh all the time. And I wasn't a good representative for Christ or for Christianity. I went to church, but during the week, you couldn't see much difference in me and any other unbeliever. I thought, oh, there was a little. You know, I would get convicted if I, you know, like one time one of my bosses wanted me to lie for him and kind of covertly help him steal some money that somebody owed him. And, you know, I, I knew I couldn't do that. I, I took a real stand where that was concerned. I was even willing to lose my job rather than do that. But I gossiped and murmured and complained. I was manipulative, controlling, selfish, and self-centered. I know that none of you are like this, but <laughs> I was. <laughs> and sadly, there's just way too much of that in the church. And God's got a higher calling on our life than to live like that. Let me close with this thought. I love what the Apostle Paul said, and I say this for my life, and I pray that you'll begin to say it for yours. In Philippians 3, he said, for I am determined to take hold of that 
for which Christ Jesus died to take hold of me. I am determined to take hold of that. Let me amplify it a little. I'm determined to live that life and be that person that Jesus died for me to be. Amen. When do we really know something? At least know it in a way where it's really going to impact our lives. How deeply do we need to know something for it to affect, say, our behavior or even how we think? You know, I think very often we tell people to read the Bible, but I really believe that we need to study the Word of God. I don't think we need information nearly as much as we need revelation in the Word of God. and we're in the middle of Tanzania in a land where the Datoga people live. And my first visit here was over a year ago, and the conditions of what we saw here just absolutely broke Shelly and Mai's heart. There was no water. People would have to walk for hours and hours one way to get dirty water. There was no education. And so we started planning and, and asking, how can we make a difference in this? And so today, we're here, and we have just dedicated one of five wells that we've dug in this area. And these are not just wells. They're solar paneled with pumps, and they have reservoirs of 10,000 liters, and they will just change this whole community. And we've dedicated a primary school that will, will do grades one, two, three, four, five. So we've literally changed this entire community uh, here in Tanzania, and we just couldn't do it without you. So we're so grateful. The people are so appreciative. And we say thank you, and God bless you. Thank you.